You know, I, I have a bit of reservation against, you know, such a introduction. I think maybe uh, people might not like that, you know. They may have their own reservations. Yep, yep. So, so. Yeah. but you know, you know what the hell with it? We offend everybody. So let's just go with it. What do you say? Yeah, why not? Look, uh, as they say, you know, Seinfeld is a show that couldn't be made today. I tend to agree, uh, disagree with all of that nonsense. Um, I think you and I had a conversation about that not too long ago. I want to say it was you. Um, but I was talking to somebody about that the other day. I was like, look, the, the, the comedy shows that people say, oh, we couldn't do this, like The Office and Seinfeld um, and, and, you know, other ones like that. Well, there's a, there's a lot of movies or, or that Trop- couldn't even Yeah, be. Tropic Thunder, you know. You're like, oh, we couldn't couldn't make it today and like why not you know that you would make a lot of money off of that film the ones that are like hypersensitive are typically terrible lame and flop you know so I'm like well you can either decide not to make it and not make any money off of it or you can make something that is you know no holds barred uh and is going to do well at the box office because one it's either good or it's funny um yeah and besides comedy is good comedy is offensive Last week, we talked with uh, Elliot West, and do you remember when I mentioned that the, um, when I mentioned about people living in the Stone Age, and he, he was saying, you know, you need to be careful. And, you know, I, th- I thought about that, and I, I am kind of hesitant to follow that path simply because it's a, it might be a slap in the face, but it is the truth, and a lot of folks just don't understand the situation. They don't quite understand certain things. And if you, you know, slap cold water onto their faces, they'll they'll get it. So I think I'm going to continue saying what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I took notice of that that too. The whole, like, you know, let's, let's be careful. And it's like, look, we're not going out of our way to offend somebody. And obviously what I was doing was a Seinfeld reference. Uh, one of my favorite episodes of, of the show with the cigar store Indian. Um, but yeah, the whole like, Hey, let's be careful and blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, we're not going out of our way to offend people, but it's like, look, if you're not being upfront and honest about like, look, this is it, like we were talking about last week, class of civilizations, man. It's like, look, the the western the western or the american civilization was you know really well definitely centuries if not millennia ahead of of the the indians well, you know there there's a book uh, that i read and I, I told you about it it's called war before civilization and you know it it talks you know cuz there's been the argument um that you know the book mentions hobbes versus uh i think rousseau and a lot of people were saying, well, you know, a lot of the savagery and butchery didn't take place until um, the Western colonists showed up. And this guy was, um, he used the information from anthropologists and he's like, no, 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 no. There have been some majorly brutal wars long before um, Western civilization even showed up. So, yeah, it's it's called mankind. You know, it's like we, we've been fighting, you know. Ever since we've gotten started, what is it like? You know, the, what is it Cain and Abel? You can go back to that if you you believe in the biblical story. Like that's your your first generation out of the Garden of Eden, and what happens? Like the brother murders the brother. You know, so yeah, violence is just part of human nature, as as deplorable as it is. Ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't yet subscribed to our show. Whether you're watching on YouTube, and if you are, subscribe, click the bell. Uh, if you enjoy this episode, like and leave a comment. That would be very helpful. Also, if you're only listening on the podcast, wherever it is you're listening, uh, you, well, not YouTube, Spotify, uh, Apple, uh, Google, wherever, uh, we are everywhere. If you have the option of leaving a rating and a review, do us a huge favor. Do that. It helps people find the show. Um, and it makes us look good and we like to look good. Um, did you happen to go to the Texas Rangers gala? Uh, no, only because, uh, the, you know, I, I, I look, I, I want to support the Texas Rangers and, you know, we love, uh, we, you know, we love Jody, but, uh, 
Uh, the, right now, you know, I took my trip to New Mexico and I depleted quite a bit of my funds. So uh, the, I think the tickets, what were they? Like 150 a person? So, which, okay, some people would be like, what, you can't afford, uh, a, a, you know, a buck fifty? It's like, well, no, I could, but, you know, I've got, you know, I mean, I need to go buy groceries later today, either today or tomorrow. <laughs> that right there is going to be $200. Yeah. It adds up, so. $200? Yes. What are you buying? Well, I'm not, you know, listen, I'm not buying just crap that, the, that you know, are on the shelves. I actually, I started, you know, many years ago, started eating organic food. I'm not a tree hugger, but, you know, I was in Europe, and I tell the story over and over again. I'm in Europe, and and everybody there was taller and thinner, especially you go to the Netherlands. And then I come back, and everyone, you know, I mean, come on. Shorter look, and fatter. <laughs> look at, look, look at photos of people on the beach in the 1960s or the 70s early 70s and then compared today you know they're doing something to our food i hate to say it but uh so I, yeah i eat organic it's a little bit more expensive but you know i'm not uh well i don't know like like two hundred dollars like is like what are you buying like six months at a time like it, it's insane but no they are screwing with our food and but they're doing it they like roundup you know, they're just spraying pesticides and everything on, on the food. So it's not like they're doing it in secret. It's it's obvious that they're doing this to our food. But at the same time, like people do it to themselves. Like they go out and, and buy just junk food. I was talking to a lady at H-E-B the other day. Um, and I was like, you know, I said, I know you see it probably more than anybody else. I said, you got these people who are completely unhealthy. And what is, what's their basket full of? Like soda and cookies and, you know, so like ice cream and all that jazz i'm like uh make a correlation you know put two and two together uh speaking of sweets dude i love the pez dispenser love it one of my favorite episodes as well yeah i got uh uh got my little did you see that little tweety bird you know Uh uh-huh i love that i love that episode (laughs) where uh elaine starts laughing yes i love it (laughs) yeah that's you know one of my little little uh, toys uh, you know it's part of it's part of my family so I've got along with my uh, my daughter and my other pet alien so there you go you know what's interesting is I have the uh, the pop um, of the Seinfeld holding on to the Pez dispenser uh, I got that for Christmas I think last year so yeah hilarious so who has hand <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to need it. <laughs> All right, man. Uh, so we're going to have a, a great guest on the show. Um, it, I, once we get him on the show, I'm going to bring up how he and I got connected. It, it's pretty funny uh, and interesting how, how it all came about. But we're going to be talking about the, well, more or less the, the Battle of uh, Arthur St. Clair, um, where it's the Battle of the Wabash. Uh, they more or less get decimated. November 4th, 1791. Let me, let me correct you on that. They were not decimated. They were annihilated. They were annihilated. The, the, the defeat, this defeat was, was pretty brutal. And I think what we need to do, because this is something that it's not even covered in school. Um, I think we need to talk about what was the Northwest Indian War. I mean, um, Northwest Indian War was a 10-year war between 1785 and 1795. Um, um, Alan Gaff wrote a book about the Battle of Wabash, which was in the, uh, in the year of 17, 1791. Um, now, uh, we, we've created some maps that we're going to show y'all. Um, when, when the French and Indian War, which was part of the Seven Years' War, took place... That it was a war between uh, uh, the British and the American colonists on one side and most of the Indians and the French on the other side. Well, the, uh, the war was a disaster for France, and Britain won, and the French were kicked out, and, and Britain took over pretty much all of Canada, um, as well as the areas uh, along the Mississippi. Um, the uh, and then after after that war was over, Britain, like I said, Britain pretty much controlled all those areas. 
Well, a lot of that, you know, when we had the Revolutionary War and we won the Revolutionary War, we ended up getting the lands, which was known as like the Ohio Valley and the Northwestern Territories. Anything east of the Mississippi, with the exception of the very southern part, which Spain still occupied, all that went from Britain to the United States. So that's how we ended up getting the Ohio Valley, the Northwestern Territories. And that is the lead up to this battle. Um, Great Britain still had um, soldiers on our territory, the, the territory that they ceded to us, Northwestern Territories. They still had forts. They still had soldiers. You know, in, in Michigan, what is uh, today Ohio, in um, Illinois, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota. So, um, so, like I said, so between 1785 and 1795, we had an ongoing war. And the, the battle, this battle of Wabash, also known as, I think, the defeat of uh, St. Clair's or St. Clair's defeat, um, that was in the middle of that war. Yeah, just to, to preface what it is that we're going to be talking about, um, guys, like you said, this isn't really discussed uh, in, in, your, in your history classes, uh, if you will, and it's sort of sort of glossed over uh you flip from you know american revolutionary war to war of 1812 uh, but this is a very important uh time in american history so alan gaff is going to be joining us he's an independent scholar and he's the author of several works including uh the best-selling lou garrick the lost memoir uh, which was pretty cool um you've got uh bob costas uh he he recommends this book. Uh, he he got a, like a review in it. Look, if you're reaching out, if you're getting Bob Costas in, you're doing something. You're doing something right. Uh, he's also written the Lost Battalion of World War One, Bayonets in the Wilderness, Anthony Wayne's Legion in the Old Northwest, which we will inevitably uh, mention. Inevitably, you like that? Uh, did we not mention? Did we not we say don't use that, that word, word enough? very often. Inevitably, <laughs> <laughs> never. In his latest book uh, that came out this year. Uh, it is The Field of Corpses, Arthur St. Clair, and the Death of an American Army. This is going to be good stuff. Alan D. Gaff is on the line. We've got him, and he wants us to call him Al, and so we shall. Al, how are you doing? Oh, we're doing fine. Uh, I've been looking forward to having this conversation with you two. Well, we are looking forward to it as well. Um, it's not every episode that we get to talk about the Indian Wars. Um, so this is going to be a, a fun conversation, I can already guarantee. But I, I did want to mention sort of something interesting between you and I, how you and I got connected. Uh, I thought this was serendipitous, if you will. Um, so we had had a guy on the show, I think it was last season, by the name of Michael Livingston, and I had done a review on his book, and you reached out to me, um, was talking about that book review and that uh, what you were doing uh, as far as uh, the Indian Wars and St. Clair, Arthur St. Clair. And so I went ahead and looked you up and I was like, man, the name sounds familiar. Looked you up and you had written a book, a very a best-selling book, a well-received book, Lou Gehrig, The Lost Memoir, and come to find out I had mentioned you and my article uh, for American Essence on my Lou Gehrig article. So I thought that was just so bizarre that you reached out to me and I had already referenced you like a few months prior. Uh, small world. <laughs> Very small, but I'm glad glad we're both in it together. Hey, I, I, I agree. And, you know, speaking of uh, in it together, our good friend Alan uh, he's got a question. He wants to start the conversation off with this question. Uh, take it away, Alan. Okay, so my question includes about three or four paragraphs before we begin. So are you uh, you ready to go? I'll stay awake for it. Go ahead. Uh, all right, good. Uh, see, that's why you, you need to have uh, you know your, your coffee ready. So, Okay, I have a Diet Coke here. Oh, there we go. Well, all right. Well, though, I got drinking water, too, so... <laughs> uh oh, you're ahead of me. <laughs> I got sweet tea. So here's my question, and, and I want to dive right into the guy that was behind the controversy because this was the Battle of Wabash, which was also known as St. Clair's defeat. So um, Arthur St. Clair, General Arthur St. Clair, 
Um, he, we're going to do the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good was that uh, he was in the Second Battle of Trenton, and it was his idea to Washington to withdraw from that battle, not to in- fight the British that day, but to go and attack Princeton instead, which was lightly defeated, which was lightly defended. And it was a stunning victory for, um, you know, Washington and, and the cause for the uh, American Revolution. The bad... Um, he was not prepared to defend uh, Fort Ticonderoga and uh, 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 Mount uh, Independence because he failed to station troops on Sugarloaf Hill, which overlooked Fort Ticonderoga. The British captured it, and St. Clair was evacuated um, that whole area, which, which co- the consequences were disastrous for the U.S., except when we got to the, battle of, the battles of Saratoga. No, and the ugly was that he was there. We know his bravery. He was there for the weather conditions, or, or he was, the ugly was the weather conditions when he crossed the Delaware for the first battle of Trenton on Christmas Day. So, so we, know he was, uh, we know he was brave, and he was there for the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the question I have is, you know, what are your thoughts on St. Clair? Um, here he was, we knew he was a good uh, tactician, but a bad commander out on the field, or was he, or or was he just uh, unlucky like Mo Green? What are your thoughts on that? Well, what I think of General St. Clair is uh, in his Revolutionary War service, as you mentioned, there were some good parts and some bad parts. So I would say he was probably average at the best, maybe a little below par uh, overall, but he became the commander of the U.S. Army in the Northwest Territory, primarily because he had been appointed governor of the territory when it had been established in 1787. So Washington, when he had a choice of commanders for an army, thought, well, here's a guy who did okay during the revolution. And he was the governor of the territory where the campaign would take place. So he would be seemingly a perfect choice because he would know the people, he would know the the territory, as well as having a military background. Uh, To help influence Washington, I think, was the fact that most of the revolutionary generals were either too old, not interested, or for some reason weren't available to command an army. So I think in in St. Clair's case, he had several things going for him, but his most uh, important decision making uh, fact was he was available. What I was going to, uh, you know, Josiah, Josiah Harmer uh, led uh, a military campaign in the same area the previous year and was uh, defeated. This was in October of 1790. Now, did, uh, did St. Clair, you know, did he underestimate the Northwestern Confederacy? Did, did he take the campaign seriously? Or were was it just you know other factors such as uh, the the mass desertions, uh, the weather that was the primary cause of defeat at Wabash? I think me one of the main problems with uh, his campaign was the fact that he was in very serious physical condition. Um, he suffered from gout, and before the battle, he was actually being carried on a litter by his soldiers because he was unable to walk or unable to ride a horse. Now, I don't know how much that would impact his mental capabilities, but it certainly had uh, consequences because he was unable to show his bravery as he had done uh, earlier in the revolution, although he performed as well as possible given, given the situation of the battle. Why didn't, I mean, he's in a bad health condition, like reading your book, like that, that is a significant, I guess uh, it plays a significant role in the book because it takes him from being with his men. um, It makes him pretty irritable. uh, And it also keeps him from really, I would assume, paying attention to what's going on around him as the army is moving uh, northward. Why didn't, St. Clair just say, look, I'm not in the position or the condition to lead this army. 
Well, one of the reasons probably is the fact that it was quite common uh, for officers, especially the senior officers, to suffer from gout. Um, gout is usually caused by an overindulgence in, say, red meat and alcohol. And uh, both red meat and alcohol were very prominent in the Army wherever it was. So it was uh, a situation where he was, uh, okay, everybody's got a little bit of it, but mine's maybe a little worse. I think I can overcome it. The gout apparently comes and goes at different times, and he may have been hoping that by the time uh, he had come in contact with the Indians that, you know, the gout would have disappeared or certainly lessened to some extent where he could have been more himself than just uh, a, almost a hopeless invalid. What do you think was the primary cause of the defeat? Or was it, because reading your book, it makes it seem there's probably like a dozen things uh, that is the ultimate cause of this defeat. But what do you think is the primary cause, if not the primary causes of the defeat? I think the the primary cause, w without a doubt, was the situation having to do with the provisions for the Army. When the Army was established by Congress on March 3rd of 1791, the quartermaster was responsible for supplying everything the army needed with the exception of food. The provisions were supposed to be provided by a private contractor, which is the way it had been done during the revolution. So as it turned out, the man responsible for feeding the army <laughs> had an office in New York City had never been to the frontier, had never realized what was necessary out there. So he managed his contract through a number of agents who usually didn't have the money on hand, uh, had problems finding food on the frontier because everything the army needed had to be shipped from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh overland. So I don't know if any of you have ever been on the... Uh, Pennsylvania Turnpike, but soldiers walked and the provisions and anything else, any gear, anything from quills to cannons were loaded on wagons. And everybody went on foot from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh, where they, everything was loaded onto flatboats, went down the Ohio River to Fort Washington at Cincinnati, and then overland to the Army. So it was a, a, a week supply chain from the very beginning and the as the as the as the army moved forward into the fall of 1791 the grass had started to die all of the other plants were dying because of frost so the only way the army could move from move its its equipment and food from Cincinnati up to where the army was in the in the field was by horseback but the problem with horseback was the horses also had to carry their own food because of the lack of forage so it the way I, I always like to describe it is it's like a semi if you had a semi going from say uh, the middle of Ohio to Cincinnati for uh, a tanker full of fuel and then back, you're not getting a tanker full of fuel because you have to count the fact that you use diesel fuel to go to the plant and back to the plant. That's the same with the horses. By the time the horses got back, they had used up a, a huge percentage of what they would supply the army and, and the horses with in the field. So... Um, Provisions were the, were the biggest thing. Forage for the horses was, was next of importance. You know, I got to, um, I, I traveled uh, between Fort Necessity and where the uh, Braddock, well, it's now known as Braddock, Pennsylvania, where uh, General Braddock was defeated. And, you know, the road that they had was is still there, the road that was built. Um, and I think Washington uh, was, was responsible for building part of that road when they were trying to get to Pittsburgh. 
Um, and I, I can attest, it, it, it's not like the uh, interstate highway system. It was, you know, you're in the middle of the woods, and uh, um, I think they even buried Braddock there on that road. Yeah, I think they did too. But, you know, once you compare it to the modern road, you have to understand there weren't tunnels back then. Right. You went over the top. Yeah, you went. Yeah, you went it even worse. <laughs> yeah, you went up and down with the mountain. I mean, it was... You, it, there wasn't uh, leveled like we have uh, like we have now in so, on some of the mountain passages. Exactly. Um, in terms of in terms of the U.S. Army, um, how disastrous was this particular battle? Uh, because you know, things that I've read was that that it pretty much annihilated what we had, all, all the reserves, everything. I, and this is something you're going to have to correct me on um, if, if my information is, is uh, not correct. But um, the, from my understanding is, is that the we didn't have much of an army back then anyway. And I believe um, after, this, uh, after this defeat, we, it wasn't even called the army. It was called the Legion. Um, but how vulnerable was the United States with the destruction of the army, if you want to call it that? Um, had, had Britain attacked us, could they have conquered us or at least have captured many of the, uh, the northern states? I mean, what was the impact overall with the entire U.S. Army? Well, to begin with, uh, you mentioned General Josiah Harmer. His army consisted of one United States regiment, which was the entire content of the infantry in the United States Army. There were uh, a couple companies of artillery, maybe a company or two of cavalry, but there was one regiment. One of the things that St. Clair was allowed to do, he recruited the second United States Infantry Regiment and was allowed, instead of uh, relying on 30-day militia that had been generally the the trend during past history, he was allowed to read, to um, recruit two regiments of 90 day, or no, excuse me, six month volunteers that were referred to as levies. Uh, the levies came from all over the United States with the exception of Georgia and the two Carolinas. So it was virtually a national army from the way it was created although half of the army was only there for six months. The other uh, United States regiments were recruited for three years. So um, St. Clair had learned enough from Harmer's defeat that he realized he needed more men, uh, including reinforcements from militia in Kentucky, so that by the time of the... Uh, the engagement, he had an army of effective troops of approximately 1,800, which doesn't account for two or 300 civilians that were along, either as wives, traders, sutlers, uh, any, any number of hangers on whenever an army is created. So the thing is, I, I won't mention the, uh, the novelist's name, but during his account of the of the campaign and battle, he said that St. Clair's army was virtually destroyed, having lost anywhere from 97 to 98% of its force, which is completely untrue, but it's a novel, so I guess you can say that. Uh, in actuality, when the losses were compiled after the battle, it turned out to be approximately 50% of his military force. There's no way to calculate how many civilians were lost in the disaster, but probably several hundred, I would say, to the is an estimate on my part. So this was the worst defeat, not just against uh, Indians, but overall, would you say, in, in entire American military history? If, if you consider the army of the size at that time compared with larger armies uh, in the past, Percentage-wise, it's definitely that way. And everyone in the country knows about uh, George Armstrong Custer's defeat in 1876. But in this encounter with the Indians by St. Clair, he lost probably about three times as many men killed 
from his force as Custer did out in the Bighorn? Yeah, but yeah, but if, when you look at it percentage wise, um, you know, the uh, I know I think Char- Charlestown, uh, South Carolina was um, that was probably in terms of numbers during that time was our worst defeat. But it, but percentage wise, I would have to say, yeah, the, that this one, the Wabash was uh, the biggest overall percentage wise. Um, yeah. do, you, do you think if Britain, you think uh, Britain could have uh, conquered us if they, because they were instigating the Indians? Oh yeah, definitely. They were they were feeding, they were provisioning, they were uh, equipping, arming. Uh, I one of the, one of the things that you you probably don't associate with an Indian fight is the fact that very few of the Indians that fought St. Clair used bow and arrows. They had muskets and rifles that were equivalent, if not maybe even a little better than the United States Army. Everything the uh, the infantry had at St. Clair's battle, <coughs> excuse me, um, was left over from the revolution. The Charleville muskets have been in storage since the war ended. Same with the cannon. Everything had to be repurposed, re- reconstituted, um, put back into shape for use in the field. So most of the Indian weapons had come more recently through British traders and the British government. So they were probably better off overall um, as far as weapons go as the uh, as the American army but the American army suffered even more from the fact that the government had no money so they never bought enough gunpowder for pr- troops to practice with their muskets they did the drill uh, according to Baron von Steuben's uh, manual from the revolution but that manual taught them how to fight a European battle where they stood in line with muskets that had no front sight, all you did was aim and everyone would fire together. Maybe a thousand people would fire. And if you were lucky, six or eight bullets would take effect. So in in that case, the Indians were probably more efficient as well as having equal or better armament because they used their muskets and rifles uh, to kill food. They did not have uh, a lot of uh, spare ammunition. They made sure every shot count, which is essentially what they did when they fought St. Clair. Do you think uh, this is just another um, item on the list of things gone wrong or leading up to going wrong? Um, you mentioned the supply train. Uh, you mentioned you know not having enough gunpowder, so therefore you really can't train. Uh, your troops like they need to be uh, in firing their weapons. But the thing that that I found pretty bizarre is, I can't remember their names, but it was the night before the attack and some Indians had, had swept through. I think they had fired on them and then they had gone in and reported this or it was reported to St. Clair and he more or less, it seems like he just brushed that off. And yet... Throughout your book, you are mentioning like there are little attacks and, and, and small things that, you know, take place while they're moving along, making it seem. And a lot of the 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 soldiers and officers and were anticipating a, an attack that morning. What in the world happened to St. Clair? Like, why did he seem, at least to me, like he didn't take that seriously, didn't put people in the positions that they needed to in order to combat a potential attack? I I think at that point, uh, St. Clair was showing his arrogance. I think he assumed that he had, you know, almost 2,000 men in the field uh, to fight against these untrained Indians, hunters out on the uh, in the wilderness, um, he thought he had them outnumbered. He thought them he had them outtrained. But the fact is, all during the campaign up to the battle, whenever Indians were reported, the scouts or whoever um, had bumped into the Indians would come back and report, and he would always dismiss them as oh they're they're just out hunters 
uh, they're not they're not scouting us. They're not paying attention to who we are. We're just uh, we're just better than they are. So I believe a lot of it was was his arrogance at that part. Now, I now uh, my understanding is that the Chickasaws and the Choctaws were the, they were with the U.S. Um, and then there was the Northwestern Confederacy. What's what are your thoughts on all of that? All the soldiers themselves. The well, the um, the Northwest Confederacy, which was uh, Shawnee, Delaware, Miami, Wyandotte, uh, and a, a number of other tribes that I can't conceive of right now, but um, they were essentially hostile to the Southern tribes like the Choctaw, Choctaw and the Chickasaw. The uh, Chickasaw and Choctaw sent about 20 warriors up uh, to assist St. Clair as either scouts or uh, interpreters or whatever, but Prior to the battle, they were sent off on a scouting expedition to go around to the west of where they assumed the Indians were, but they never ran into Indians until after the battle when they encountered a few going home with prizes and trophies and scalps. So although they came up to help, they never got involved in anything really important. So, but the, I guess the biggest thing that went wrong with St. Clair that I, I forgot to mention earlier is the fact that by the morning of the battle, he thought he was 15 miles from his, um, goal. from his goal of reaching Kikianga or Three Rivers or what is now Fort Wayne, Indiana. He thought he was 15 miles away. That's maybe maybe two days. Actually, he was 55 miles away. He was totally lost. He thought he was on a branch of the St. Joseph River, which flows to Fort Wayne that he could follow. But in fact, he was on a tributary of the Wabash River. So even though he had a surveyor along, the surveyor had never been there. And no one knew where they were. No one in the army had ever been that way through the wilderness prior to the battle. The smartest thing for him to have done would have been to follow Josiah Harmer's trail directly to Three Rivers and Kikianga. But instead, he wanted to do a, um, a, a kind of a combination political and civic thing. He wanted to cut a road directly north from Cincinnati and, and Fort Washington so that the road itself would open up the property for settlers once he won his battle against the Indians and his his friends were the ones who owned the property at that time so it was kind of a uh, a friendly mishmash because well in, in fact like I mentioned St. Clair was a general of the army as well as the governor of the territory there were other individuals who held multiple positions like one would be a judge uh, a militia officer and um a, a shopkeeper or a merchant so their jobs were all intermingled and everyone who was in the upper crust basically had one or two or three jobs that uh, were with their friends and buddies so i want to bring us back to what alan was mentioning earlier about the fort ticonderoga situation I, and i find it very similar to uh, the battle of the wabash situation as well he decided not to put troops um i believe i believe it was like on, on on the mountain ridge to keep an eye on british soldiers moving up he thought that they weren't going to be able to move up that high ground because of their artillery of what they were going to be having to bring up well he was wrong and they ended up having they ended up l losing fort ticonderoga in very similar fashion, St. Clair does the same thing with, with, this, with this battle. Um, he doesn't put people where he needs to put them in order to protect their ground and, and their own people. Um, he, in both instances, is court-martialed but then exonerated. 
do you think that he should have been exonerated or do you think, hey, somebody has to be held responsible for what took place at this battle and it is you, St. Clair? I personally think that St. Clair should have been held responsible, but the country was new at that time. Uh, as a matter of fact, the investigation into St. Clair's defeat was actually the first official congressional investigation. And after um, calling witnesses, checking testimony, Congress uh, set a precedent, not only for being the first investigation, but the first one to basically pass on everything and not hold anyone accountable, which still goes on today as far as I am concerned. But um, that was that was a situation where I, I think someone needed to be held accountable. And I, it, it, I think the overall impact of St. Clair's defeat was to allow Anthony Wayne to step up with the next army going against the Indians and essentially do everything right that St. Clair had done wrong. St. Clair did not learn from Harmer, but Anthony Wayne learned from St. Clair. So from then on, um, the, the United States government realized that if you're going to fight Indians, wherever it was in the, in the Northwest Territory, the Plains, the Rockies, wherever, you needed to have a solid military force, properly trained, properly equipped, properly fed, and properly led, so that from then on, campaigns against the Indians were organized that way, with a few exceptions, obviously, like uh, the Fort Dade massacre in Florida, uh, the Fort Kearney massacre, and of course, you know, Custer's defeat at Little Bighorn. But there, there are some people who call the uh, Anthony Wayne basically the uh, the the god of the infantry because he was the one who realized how an army should be prepared and did so. The smartest thing Anthony Wayne ever did was say, uh, "Nobody's going to interfere with me. I will report either directly to the Secretary of War or the President. No one else. Every." Every other time I am on my own, I will make my own decisions. And that was one of the most important parts of his organization because it took anywhere from oh, 30 to 45 days for information to go from the wilderness to the capital at Philadelphia. And then another 30 or 45 days to come down the river and back up to the army in the field. So the commander on the field, in this case, Anthony Wayne, had to have the ability to make decisions on his own without waiting for political interference from uh, Philadelphia. You had, you had mentioned when you, when you emailed me um, regarding, uh, you, you had mentioned the Battle of Crazy Book that Michael Livingston did, which he sort of, he, he, he actually changes the location of the battle. Like what everybody thinks is the location of the battle, that's not where it is. Um, you had said that your book, uh, The Field of Corpses, corrects some narratives and some falsehoods or some beliefs that people have about the battle. What are some of the things that are out there that are believed about this battle that are either misunderstood or just false? Well, over 100 years after the battle, the federal government uh, put up a, a large obelisk uh, to commemorate the battle at the, what is now uh, the city of Fort Recovery. On one side of this big obelisk, there's a brass tablet or bronze tablet. I'm not sure. I'm not a metallurgist, but it uh, it lists all of the officers who were killed during St. Clair's fight. One of the things I, I have always tried to do is correct the historical record, which is almost always wrong. And this list was compiled from the first list that had been published in the uh, Eastern newspapers. And it serves as a reminder that you should never, ever trust the first version of a news story. Because on this large list of officers who were killed, there are actually 18 men who survived. 
and died anywhere from 1801 through 1844, as well as two officers who are mentioned who never existed. <laughs> they're, they're two ghost officers, I guess, but that's the kind of thing that I like to clear up when, when I write my history books. And uh, my uh, St. Cl- well, this field of corpses is my 18th book. No, excuse me, my 15th book. I'm counting manuscripts. Um, the, all, but, all but the Lou Gehrig book have been on military history, and that's been my, my goal all along is to correct the historical record because so many historians take for granted things that have already been printed as history, but you can't trust that. You have to go back to the original sources whenever possible and get to the real root of the story. And when you do, it makes an even better story than the fake ones that are being floated around now. I was going to, one last question, and I don't know if you'd consider this off the subject, but it's related in some way. The, after the Treaty of Paris, um, when we won the Revolutionary War, um, the Northwestern areas, the Ohio Valley, was given uh, was given to the United States, but the British hadn't vacated yet. They were they still occupied everything until uh, Jay's Treaty, and then they returned during the War of eighteen twelve. So, the War of eighteen twelve is called the Second War of Independence. Do you agree with that assessment? Because the British just never really respected us, and they kept their soldiers and the forts in the Northwestern Territories. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's a a pretty good argument. Uh, As a matter of fact, during Wayne's campaign in 17, it was either 93 or 94, the British came from Detroit and built another fort along the Maumee River in what was obviously American territory based upon the treaty. But it didn't stop them from doing that because it brought them closer to their Indian allies so they could keep them supplied and armed to fight against the the American army or the American settlers wherever they could find them. So yeah, I think I think that's a fairly uh, good thing. It's it's yeah, you, it's it's almost like you could say the same thing about World War One, World War Two. You know, World War Two was basically to um, finish off what had been started in World War One and hadn't been accomplished. So yeah, I think I think that's fair. And if you look at all of the uh, the European campaigns and battles over the centuries, you can. Because, well, like the Hundred Years' War, they didn't fight continually for a Hundred Years' War. There were, you know, episodes of it. So, yeah, I think that's a fair fair statement about the British and the Americans in the War of 1812. Yeah, I mean, because today I think uh, uh, King Charles III was coronated. And, uh, you know, we have been, we haven't had a war other than maybe like the Pig War. Uh, we haven't uh, had any problems with Britain since uh, the War of 1812, so... Let's uh, hope that only one pig is going to be the uh, the lone casualty between now and then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully that's the last casualty. That would be great. I I'd like to see that from every war. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the book is filled of corpses. You can go get it um, wherever, especially on Amazon. Uh, and when you get it do us a favor for Al, uh, leave a fantastic review because it's a great book. Um, tons and tons and tons of information there. And speaking of like, that's what we talk about on the show quite often. Al, uh, is going to the source. Um, always trying to go to the source cause that's where, and, and even if the first source is the newspaper, well, you better check that out. <laughs> better check that out pretty clearly. Um, Al, thanks so much for, for being on the Sons of History podcast. It's been a, a real pleasure to have you on. Well, thank you very much. And it, it's been a fun afternoon. I really enjoyed this. We'll have to do it again. Absolutely. Fascinating, fascinating conversation. I loved being able to ask him certain questions. And, uh, you know, I, I meant to ask him, but I, I do believe very strongly that, that you know, the Battle of uh, Wabash, which, like I said, is not covered. I mean, you, you just, you don't know about it until you start reading history books on it. But to me, the Battle of Wabash reminded me of the Battle of Isandalwana, which was a, uh, it took place in 1879 in South Africa. 
when the British got their asses kicked by the Zulu warriors. And it was such an annihilation that the Zulus, some of the Zulus kept going and, uh, or at least a wing of it, kept going and attacked a British outpost known as Rourke's Drift. And uh, that was in the movie Zulu with Michael Caine. So if you watch the movie Zulu, they talk about a disastrous battle that took place that just annihilated the British. And that was Isandalwana. So this reminds me of pretty much the same thing. What are your thoughts? Um, I don't know much about that battle. Um, I know the the movie, which I also haven't seen. I think the movie is called Zulu, right? Well, there's Zulu with Michael Caine, and then there's Zulu Dawn, which was made uh, about maybe 15 years later on the 100th anniversary of the battle. Um, and that one had Peter O'Toole and Burt Lancaster. Now Zulu, now, Zulu Dawn, although made later, actually is kind of the prequel to Zulu. So, yeah, I'd, I'd watch both of them. They're, I, I like Zulu better because I love, I love Michael Caine. Um, but, but you got to watch Zulu Dawn to understand what the big deal was about Zulu. Okay, yeah. Well, I, I'm a big fan of Michael Caine, but I'm also a big fan of Peter O'Toole, Lawrence of Arabia, and Burt Lancaster. Burt Lancaster is good stuff. Did you know Burt Lancaster was in Field of Dreams? No. I, you know, I never saw that movie. I only saw bits and pieces of it. Really? Yeah. Wow. I'm not a I'm not a baseball fan. Well, it doesn't really matter if you're a baseball fan or not. Here here's what I can guarantee you. And and I know you won't watch it. Um, but if you watched it, you would probably cry your eyes out. That's what I did last time I watched it. It's 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 so it's so good and it's about baseball, but it's also it's not about baseball. It's about fathers and sons. Um, so yeah. It's 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 my favorite sports movie. All right. Well, uh, that I, I don't, I don't, I don't see myself crying over a baseball movie. I don't see you admitting to crying over a baseball movie. I don't see yourself. I don't see yourself admitting to weeping because you would. I guarantee you, you would. I, you know what? Here's the thing: to make you watch the film and actually watch it and, and pay attention, not like watch it and then you know put up your two hundred dollars worth of groceries, um, but actually sit there and watch the film. I will bet you, and you got to be honest. You must be honest if you're going to do this. I will bet you twenty bucks that you will weep. Um, I or may at have, least, or at least you will at least shed a tear. I might have some salty discharges, but I don't think I'll be crying. So. Yeah, I know. You'll be like, like, what is this salty discharge? Because you're so unused to weeping. Oh, man. All right, man. Um, well, that's all I've got. Uh, we've made an inordinate amount of Seinfeld references uh, during this episode, which is good. But we didn't say inevitable very much. I think it was just that one time. Uh, so that's good. That's a plus. Uh, that's called improvement. And anything else, man? Because that is that's all I got. No, I'm gonna enjoy some pretzels here in a bit and uh You're getting thirsty? Yeah. But hey, I got my water because they're making me thirsty. These pretzels are making me thirsty. All right, bro. I love you, man. I will uh talk to you later. I hope you have a good week, as well as all of you. Y'all take care.